Okay. Okay, it looks like some questions are coming in. Great. So let's get started with the content. So what was asked of me was to sort of explain the big one, which is what's the difference between primitive and fine cut, okay? And the problem is the difference between primitive and fine cut is a scale. And where you draw the line between the two could be different than where someone else draws the line. And my point is, why are we drawing lines, okay? It does help a little bit to have some terms that sort of describe, but there's going to be a lot of things that don't fit, okay? So I'm going to move a little bit off to the side, which will focus the camera on the stuff in the background. Okay, so hopefully you can still hear me. The one at the far end is a fine cut shaded, right? It's done with very small cuts and it's done so that it looks like there's a gr gr uh, gradual change in value in the petals. The two stair risers, clearly primitive. Wider cuts, that's not a real flower, but what the heck, right? And then this one, this is fine cut shaded, okay? This is fine cut shaded. What's this one? Is it primitive? I don't know. It's wide cut, whitish cut, it's a seven. But is it really primitive? It's not fine cut. It's kind of like my village of Pemberville. It falls somewhere in between, okay? And there's a whole scope of rugs that are somewhere in between. Now, what can make something primitive and something instead of fine cut, I'm gonna call it realistic. Because you can hook a primitive rug in a small cut in primitive colors, in a primitive style, and it'll look like a primitive rug. So we're not gonna talk about cut size, okay? Because I don't think that's the perfect delimiter. Because you can do a shaded flower that is absolutely huge. And I can't remember which teacher was teaching that for several years. That's absolutely huge and it's shaded. And I wouldn't, even though it's hooked in a nine cut, I would never call that primitive because that's a realistic depiction of a large flower. So I would go to it more from the standpoint of what is the subject matter, okay? Is the subject matter meant to be a little bit more realistic or is it meant to be a little bit more primitive and what's the difference between the two primitive you hook what you know you know a dog has four legs so you're going to hook all four legs darn it right all four legs <laughs> realistic is that the dog is situated in such a way that you can only see three legs so you only hook three legs. It doesn't look like a three-legged dog. We know that other leg is there. It's behind his, it's just the angle we're looking at him. We can't see his fourth leg. That's realistic. And then you have primitive. Another way to, to sort of sort it down is in primitive, you hook what you know. And in realistic, you hook what you see. In realistic, things are usually in scale. Now, you could have a big person who's in the foreground and then a smaller house in the background, and that makes sense. But in a primitive, you could have a big person right next to the house, and it doesn't really make sense. There's no perspective going on, but that's primitive. It's out of scale. Things are a little bit wonky. The cat is could be as big as the house. It doesn't really matter. Um, I lost my train of thought. I'm doing that these days. Um, but the main point is that to me, primitive is not realistic and fine cut tends to be more realistic. But again, it's a scale. Always think of it as a scale instead of this side and that side. We're all on the rug hooking spectrum together, okay? And where you fall has less to do, it, let's create art. 
let's do what we do and have fun with it. Now, one thing too that kind of comes into play are categories. And categories would be like if there's a rug show, they might do categories and it could be things like floral and animals or people, geometrics, pictorials. Pictorials tend to be landscapes plus interiors plus anything that's at like a scene. Okay, it goes into pictorials. So they're more, think of more as categories in a rug show. Okay, so you're looking at a rug, where would this one fit? Okay, um, then there are uses for rug hooking. There's the rugs that go on the floor and the rugs that go on the wall and how you finish them is important to both because the one on the wall, that edge is still going to deteriorate if you don't know where your knife fold edge is. And I have a video about knife fold edges, so look for that. But if you don't know where the knife fold edge is, you might think you're doing a really good finish on the edge of your rug and it turns out you're exposing it to be rotting quicker, um, to be dying quicker than it really should be. Okay, so um, finishing is as important for things on the wall as it is on the floor. There's also 3D. You know, I love making footstools. I love making the little pencil pouches, um, that type of thing. Um, and before I go on, just a little, quick little update, because I know the pencil pouches have dried up. Okay, they are all of a sudden really hard to find. I got this one and this one the other day at um, Office Max. Um, they only had the one black one. Um, they're expensive-ish. Um, I am then buying them, paying sales tax, and then putting them on my website just to help out some rug cookers who are looking for them. So you can still find the pencil pouches on my website. Walmart has this style. Now it's different in size. Let me get them lined up. There we go. See how it's longer by about an inch or so? It's not rounded. It has the same pocket configurations. It just doesn't have the curved side. And when it expands, unfortunately, it expands with an, what I think is an ugly white or light colored um, fabric in there instead of, instead of a nice discreet black that simply disappears, okay? But in a pinch, this would work. And you can take the patterns and just adjust them and make them like an inch taller. Um, use the tall patterns in particular would be one way to do about that. So that's sort of the general gist of style terms that I can think of. So what have I forgotten? Let's take a look at the comments. Um, I'm looking for um, question marks hopefully with questions about this topic. Um, Joan is asking, she says, is the small rug to the left of the two stair risers? To the I see the camera gets flipped around, so I don't know what, well, otherwise you would say Village of Pemberville. So you mean the roses is a small rug to the left of the two stair risers or table runners, a pattern of yours. No, it's House of Price. That was one which is now Honey Beehive. Um, that was one that was a required piece. It doesn't have the border on it. I added the border because I like a border on a rug. Um... And I'm going to come back and I'm going to grab some of these questions that are not about this topic and it'll be after and it'll be in the replay inside the rug cooking journey, but not in the public replay. Um, lots of questions, but here's one. What is painterly style? Well, that's a term that was coined to mean that it looks very realistic or it looks impressionistic. 
meaning it's done in the manner of a painting. So it looks realistic, but it's not necessarily super fussy is sort of how I see that term coming into play. Um, and, and I don't know who actually coined it the first time, but it, it was not a term that I saw 20 years ago. And then it's kind of coming around at this point. Um, there was another question. I don't see it offhand, but someone wanted to know what Waldebro was. That's another term of a style. That's simply sculpted. So that means that you pull up the loop super high. If you're a member of the rug cooking journey, go into the creative stitches course and look for sculpting. I don't think I, I might have used the word Waldoboro. I don't remember, but it's the same thing. And you hook it up super high. I mean, I'm talking like an inch, inch and a half, maybe even in the middle. And then you take scissors and you start doing a haircut and you just trim it down to size. It's not a hooking method I enjoy doing. You've got to really pack in the wool. Um, you should use a smaller cut size because otherwise when you cut it, you're going to have a lot of big thick lines. So if you do the small ones, they're more like dots. So it's prettier. It makes a prettier sculpting. You'll see it often in fruit rugs or sometimes in scrolls, that kind of thing. Um, it's messy, 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 messy. Um, I had a student who hooked it with um, Easter eggs and she got home and she goes, I didn't realize how messy this was until I did it at home. <laughs> yeah, it's messy. Yeah, it's messy. Um, let me see. Painterly. Kind of on the topic, Denise is asking, do you need different fabric? Or, or base, we call it foundation fabric or backing for the different types of rug hooking, realistic, primitive punch. Not for realistic and primitive because you could hook it wide cut and it could be realistic, okay? So you have to be careful about what that means. More, It's more to do with the size of your cut. So if you're doing fine cut, particularly if you're working with linen, you're gonna want a fine cut linen if you're hooking wider cuts, you're gonna want a primitive linen. That's why I like rug warp. I use it for everything. Um, if you're doing punching, I don't do punching, so I'm, I can't answer many questions about that, but I've been told that the best backing for that is monk's cloth, which is really stretchy and nasty, and I don't recommend it at all for rug cooking. Um, but the punchers seem to like it. Nancy says, is realistic rugs truer in color where primitive rugs are duller in color? Generally, yes, but not always. I mean, um, think about a real, think about a painting in an art museum done with muted colors. Or think about someone hooking a, a landscape scene and it's foggy. They're not using bright colors to do that, right? So it has to do with what it's depicting. So what it's showing is a realistic scene, okay? And I think you can hook primitive in bright colors. Uh, quite frankly, back in the day when those rugs were hooked, you peel down in there and you look down in between and you get past the faded look on top, those rugs were hooked quite brightly. Um, so it's really not so much color. Um, that has to do with the palette that you're using when you're hooking your wool. Jane says modern is an interesting style since what was modern in 1970. I'm not sure what you're asking, Jane, or what you're commenting. But yeah, what I don't see much of that makes me a little sad is I don't see like a town and country van in a rug. And, you know, you, there's a couple of rugs out there of people on, on computers or walking around with a phone. Um, we tend to see hooked rugs with horse and buggies, you know, more old timey stuff. So we don't hook much that are current with us. 
Um, she says, continued, in 1970s might not be modern in 2020 thought. Yeah, I, I think it's it's going to depend on what's in style, you know, and and what what's a sign of the times. I know several people are hooking COVID rugs, you know, just to document what we've just been through. Um, and, and those will be, you know, a point in time. Um, definitely a rug that the archivers 100 years from now can probably pinpoint to a particular, you know, chunk of time. That's for sure. We're going to make that real easy for them. Um, okay. I think I've gotten to the end of the question. So that's it on rug hooking styles. I guess the, my main point is stop trying to fit everything into a cubby. Okay. This is one big world of art and we don't necessarily look at watercolor paintings and go, oh, that's this style and that's this style. We just enjoy it for what it is. So enjoy your rug cooking for what it is and stop trying to put it in a pigeonhole. And don't put yourself in a pigeonhole. Hook your own rugs, hook your own style, because if you don't hook it, nobody else is. Okay, so that's it for the replay. Now let me go back. Let me go back and grab some of these questions because a couple of them were really interesting. Again, I'm looking for the double question marks. Um, here, I'm going to grab Anne's question, even though it doesn't have the question marks in front of it. Um, she says, please explain the technique of a beauty line. Um, how to decide on color choice. How many rows of hooking. Thank you, and I appreciate all your time you share with this great rug hooking community. Okay, so beauty line, it's all about what you think looks right, okay? The beauty line is the separation between the main background and the border background. If you don't have a border, you can't have a beauty line, okay? You have a border. So it, it's that separation in that line. How do I decide? I'll often hook a little bit of any color I think will work. And then once it's all done, I can either pull out and put in or go, you know, I like it with all different colors. Um, I almost always hook it with, instead of like all one red, I'll hook it with a bunch of different reds just so that I get that variation and it doesn't look like a hard marker drawn around the outside edge of the rug. You can do multiples and the way I'll sort of um, audition it is, let's say on this board, I, I'm ready to finish this, but if I wasn't, if I was gonna make this bigger and put a border on it, I would lay down some rows of wool. And this is how I figure out what's gonna work. I'm gonna lay these down like this and go, okay, yeah, I like that. And then I'll hook that, you know, and I'll lay down what I'm gonna use for my, maybe this will be my border um, background, this green. And I might do, this is really hard to do <laughs> holding like this. Maybe I'll hold two rows out here just to make it look a little thicker because that's gonna have a lot of that green if this is a border background, right? But that's how I audition it. Now, once I decide, yeah, I kind of like these this way, you're not sure until you hook it, right? So I'm gonna hook a little bit, usually around a corner, and that'll give you a full idea of what that color looks like. Nobody knows, not even us teachers, nobody knows for sure what's gonna work. We're gonna say, and, and if you watch and you're real observant in a rug cooking class, the teacher will say, try this and this and this. And she means what she's saying. Try it. She's not 100% sure. So try it. That's what we would do if we were home alone at our rug cooking frame. We would be trying it because we don't know for sure what's going to work. No one knows for sure until, unless you've worked with every wool 
that's in a particular rug. And there are some rugs that are like that. Some people will buy one of my patterns and they'll want to hook it similarly to how I hooked it. And if I still have some of those wools available, which is rare, then yeah, I can say this will work and this will work. And I'll know with certainty what will work because I've walked that path before, but that doesn't always happen. Usually you're on uncharted territory because even if, God forbid, you're copying a photograph, please don't copy a photograph. There's nothing wrong with buying someone's pattern and then hooking it the same way it is on the image, but you can do better than that. I know you can, and I can show you how. There's techniques inside the rug cooking or the color planning for rug cookers course. There's tons of information in the rug cooking journey. And just come on here and ask a question and I'll steer you in the right direction. You can figure this out. If you have the right wool, you can hook anything. You don't need anything fancy. Okay, looking for another one. So Sherry, this looks like more like a comment. She says, I'm just finishing whipping my first rug. Yay, Sherry, and congratulations on taking it all the way to the finish line, right? She says, started before I found you on monk's cloth. Ooh, so it was a bit of a hot mess. Looking forward to working on my rug warp. Monk's cloth can be a, an issue because the outside edge often ends up a little bit wavy. Um. I feel really rude just going past these comments. Hello, everybody. Oh my gosh, I'm seeing so many people I know and people I don't know. Thank you for being here. I really appreciate it. Um, answered that one. Lily is saying, how do I find you at Facebook? Google it, okay, or, or search it once you get on Facebook. Just type in my name and you'll find me there. Kathy is saying, is it okay to whip my small rug before squaring it with more steaming? Um, if you don't mind it being crooked, yeah, <laughs> you can do whatever you want. I found that if I don't square it up and let it dry, it's always going to end up a little bit crooked. So if I'm doing something really small like this, it's not going to matter. It's not that big of a deal. If I'm doing it on rug warp, it's going to be more straight than not. It's more important if you're using linen or a monk's cloth. Joan is saying, I can't chat on YouTube. Well, Joan, what you need to do is you need to log in on YouTube. Okay, so you need to create an account. And this isn't just because of my um, channel here. You're not able to comment on anybody's channel and you're not able to subscribe, right? So you're going to want to create an account and then subscribe to my channel and then click that little bell. Oh, good point. Listen, I don't get distracted on YouTube. You know, I don't go to Facebook much because I find myself all off into the cosmos. Holy cow. Yeah, it's really bad. Janet, you're a sweetie. So follow you wherever you go. Lily says, when doing a rug, some areas are smaller. Should you different cuts? Uh, should you use different cuts? Probably, yeah. Um, within It depends on the design. Um, but chances are, whoever designed it, if they're a good designer, they designed it in such a way that you should be fine. You should be fine. Um, I find it a little disruptive if you've got great big, giant, chunky cuts. And then all of a sudden threes for like a face. It just looks odd to me. Um, so you just have to kind of look at it and go, what is it? What, what do I want to do? And try it. Let is, let's experiment. Joni says, so at what count do you change your hook size to accommodate the larger cuts? I never change my cut size or my hook size. I use the same hook for three as I do for um, a nine. 
but I don't use a big old harpoon hook is what I call them. I own one, but I don't use it much. Um, this is what I'm calling a harpoon hook. Get that in the center, okay? Also known as a Hartman hook. This is not exactly a Hartman hook. This one came out of Australia, and it was done by a charitable organization, and I bought a bunch of these hooks. I don't like that business end because I tend to stick it through the fabric into my finger and I'll end up with a bloody finger after the end of the day. So I use a hook that looks like this, where it's just, um, it, it, it's hand forged, basically. It's nice and thick down here at the bottom, and then it's just bent over, nice and sweet. Um, if anyone knows how to make those, or your husband knows how to make those, get in touch with me, I'll trade you wool. Um, but right now I can't find anybody who does that. So, um, oh, and this was a great feature that we had done at Sauter Village. Isn't that cool? They were engraving our hooks. Of course you had to pay for it, but I think I had two of them engraved, which is nice. Then I know for sure which ones are mine and I don't accidentally sell my favorite hook, which would be a really, really bad thing. Um... Linda says, when I see lots of shading, it's not primitive to me. True, right, because shading is what creates realism, so that's more realistic. It could be shaded, but hooked in a number eight or a number nine cut, and that to me is still realistic. It's not primitive, just because it's a big cut. It has to do, for me, it has to do more with what is the image. What are they trying to, to do? What is my favorite style? Um, probably somewhere in between. Um, I like to dabble from time to time with realism. And I'll hook, um, you know, like I hook the, whoops, over here. I hook the little rose pil um, pillow. I did, this is one of those, oh crap kind of things. I hooked this one before I went to teacher's workshop because my teacher said, you need to have to hook a rose before you go. And then they made us, there we go. And then they made us hook this one. <laughs> and I was like, I don't want to hook another pink rose. Can I change the color? She goes, if you think you can do better. And I'm like, I want a bigger challenge. I'm going to do a white rose. And it's only as good as the pattern that is drawn. And that rose was a little bit wonky. I wanted to change the whole thing. And I thought that might be, for teacher's workshop, that might be a little far off. Um, so I stayed kind of within the parameters. But I do think if you want to hook a realistic flower, go outside, take a photograph of that flower, bring it in, trace it, and, and take the photograph during lighting that is exciting. You know, try you know, just after sunrise, try just before sunset, you know, look at it at different times of the day and take your photograph and then copy where the values are on that rose. That's going to teach you more than anything. Uh, yes, Jess says, so maybe we long for more nostalgic times. I agree. Um, Jan is saying, when I think of modern, I think more abstract. How would you describe what I'm seeing called contemporary rugs? Um, it depends on who's defining them as contemporary rugs. It usually just means rugs that were done recently. Really, literally, that's usually what all it means. Yay, Janelle says, no rules in rug cooking. Be free, my friends. <laughs> Elizabeth says, can you pack and also have holidays? Yes, you can. Which is why you need to relax. Relax. Breathe. <laughs> okay. Don't worry about the backing showing. Okay, get that out of your head. You can put those loops really, really far apart. 
And by the time you get all your hooking in and around it, you're not going to be able to see your backing. And can you see the backing if you bend it? Yes. And you should be able to see the backing when you bend it. Um, you want your rugs to lay flat. If they're packed and they're humped up like this and you have to force it flat, that means you are stretching that backing as to its, you know, it's not just laying there all nice and relaxed. How long would you survive under that kind of tension? Not long, right? So don't pack your rugs. It takes you longer. It makes your rugs, oh, husband, answer that phone. Um, sorry about that, guys. I forgot that my computer makes a noise when my phone rings. Um, but you, you want it to be relaxed because if it's not relaxed, it doesn't have room for all the loops. That's why it's humping up to make room for the loops. Uh, Jess is saying maybe we see more vintage topics in rugs because there's a part of us or some of us that are nostalgic for simpler times. It's like having a piece of that time, even if you can't have that actual item. Sure. Um, I just wonder when they're going to start doing, you know, mainstream, you know, people with cell phones and, you know, that kind of thing. And it becomes very common because that's nostalgic, right? Because now what the camera's built into our eyes. I don't know. Um... Cynthia says there is a contemporary rug group on Facebook. It's different, but I like them. I haven't hooked anything that I think would go in that pigeonhole. Um, Lily is saying, do you decide background color first before cho choosing the colors for background? Do you decide background color first? Yes. Before choosing the colors for maybe for the rest of the rug? Yeah. What? What I teach in the color planning for rug cookers is choose the biggest areas first, okay? Because it's just like life. If you choose not to go to college, you can't be a doctor or lawyer or, you know, a whole bunch of things, right? You still have options, but there's a whole bunch of stuff over here that you can't do. Um, and then later, if you decide to live in the South, you're not living in the north, okay? Do the big decisions first. Figure out that background. Is it light? Is it dark? Because if you don't know what that background is, how do you choose the motifs that are going to stand off up off of that background, okay? And there are times when you want them to blend, you know, like these little st stair risers that I did over there. I wanted the background to blend a little bit. There's a couple places where I've got a real dark, um, almost black, like down in through here, just to give the flower a little more oomph. But I was okay with things sort of blending and blurring away. Um... Oh, and there's a good comment. Jess says, you also have to be on a device and not watching on YouTube TV in order to comment. So, yeah, and I know some people will do that. I can't imagine what I look like on a TV. But some people do this on the TV and then keep also a tablet or a phone with the comments open so that they can type into the comments. So you can, you can get on both ways if your Internet is strong enough to do that. Um, what cut did you do your pencil pouch? Is the pencil pouch class a forever class? Because I probably won't get to it anytime soon. Yes, it is a forever class. The only thing that's not is the membership. The membership is a monthly. And what you're getting for one month, holy cow, if I had to charge you up front for everything in the rug cooking journey, no one would buy it. It'd be too expensive because there's a lot of stuff in there. So it's a month by month basis. The All the other courses are you pay one time and then that's it. These are a number seven cut for the most part because that's my favorite cut. That's my comfort zone. I like the look of it. 
it treats my body well. I don't feel I don't feel any injury after hooking uh, for a long time with it. Um, and yeah, that's that's my comfort zone. Um, if you are interested in the pencil pouch, the course is still there, and you can apply this method to a lot of different things. Um, in fact, the first time I taught or wrote an article. Uh, for one of the rug hooking magazine books with the pencil pouch in it, um, I'm showing what I'm calling a slip cover for a purse. And I'm going to be adding that kind of information to the course because as the pencil pouches get harder to find, what I'm teaching there and how you attach it is in the patterns that are in there. You can modify those and, and still make you know, a simple little purse out of that. Um, Elizabeth says, what are you looking for my husband to make for a wool trade? He's super good with woolworking. Well, it's not woodworking I need, it's metal smithing. I need someone to make the actual hooks. Um... How do you know when to outline and when not to? Depends on what you want. Um, that method that I showed you a minute ago about lying, laying the strips down, do that with your motif. Lay it in place and then put another color. Does that look right? Sometimes I'll do, particularly for florals, I'll do multiple outlines. You know, I might outline it in yellow and then in orange and then hook it in red. And it gets that feeling of shading without it being a swatch. Um, and it breaks up a large area, okay? If what you're hooking is really, really small, you probably don't want to outline it because there's not going to be enough room for an outline and a different color fill. So it just kind of depends on what you're doing. Um, you can outline everything in... A black, I hesitate to say that because I don't recommend using flat black. Use something that's a little bit off of black and then fill it in. That's easy peasy. It makes it simple to um, choose colors for what you're doing. Um, and it's very graphic and it looks a little bit like a cartoon or a comic, that kind of thing. So it depends on the look you're going for. Um, if you're hooking a realistic landscape like the village of Pemberville, there's no outlining, nothing, okay? Everything gets hooked, the grass gets hooked right up to the building. You don't do a row of grass around the building and then hook. You just do everything straight up to it. Uh, which teacher's workshop? I was a member of Southern for quite a few years and then my husband had a heart attack. And it took me off my game for that year, and the next year we couldn't afford to go, and then once you're out of the habit, ugh, yeah, it got hard to go back. Lily says, what size is your hook? Okay, I get asked that a lot. There is no such thing as sizes in rug hooking. It's not like knitting, you know, where there's a U.S. size and maybe a, I don't know what, what the other size is, but there's usually two sizes, like on knitting needles. We don't have that kind of control because people will just make their own. Now, there is um, the width of the shaft. Um, this one is, this one's probably a six millimeter because I only had sixes and eights and that's not thick enough to be an eight. So I like at least a six millimeter. I just wish I could get, you know, this hook, this handle, but with a nice bent and not in brass because <laughs> brass doesn't stick to magnets. So I'm not crazy about it from that point of view, but it's a serviceable hook and it works really good. I just cannot hook small cuts in that because it's, it, it, it's, it's like using a backhoe to dig your holes. And my husband tried to help me with that. When I was planning things in the new flower bed, he goes, I'll dig your holes. And he wanted to use the backhoe. No, I'm going to use a spade or I'm going to use a little hand trowel because I'm hooking little places or, or digging in small areas. So to me, the Hartman hook feels like a backhoe. 
you know, and it does the job. It just, you got to practice with it and see if you like it. Um, Elizabeth, Elizabeth says, bit off topic, but do you know of anything that I can back my work once hooked? I use assorted yarn, but it keeps catching and pulling out when moving on the frame. Um, I know some people are using that press and seal, um, uh, plastic wrap. Um, I would be a little concerned about it because I don't think it's pH neutral because we don't worry about pH with food. Um, that would be my biggest concern. It's like when people use the, the plaster repair stuff to draw, you know, and instead of red dot and they put the sticky plaster stuff down and they pull it off and they're like, it's great. It doesn't leave a residue on the molecular level. I can guarantee you some of that residue is still there. And is that residue pH neutral or is it going to speed up the deterioration of your backing? I don't want that anywhere near me, okay? So what I use instead is I'm selling a dotless red dot. It doesn't have the red dots, which quite frankly, half the time they weren't printed straight anyways. Um, so I use a dotless red dot and it works, it works wonders. Um, Hubby just said, if I get him a lathe, he'd make the hooks. <laughs> That'd be an expensive hook, wouldn't it? Oh, Jess is saying, so mine are humped up even with 5.5 factors. So I guess I'm still okay. Yeah, the average factor is going to be four. So you're still using one and a half layers more than the average rug hooker to hook yours. If you if yours is a 5.5 factor, spread them out a little bit. You want to be able to touch them loops and they should be nice and spongy. Oh, she says hers aren't humped up with a 1.5. Um, how would you describe Art Deco? Um, I would just use the art. I mean, that's a particular style. Go to a good art book or, you know, Google that on the internet. That is a very specific style to a specific pat period. Um, yeah, and Art Deco is Art Deco. It's very unique. How much space is okay between hooking rows on the back of your rugs? Can you show us one of the back of your rugs, please? Okay, so here's this little piece. Um, what else do I have sitting around that's partially hooked? How about this one? This is a teaching piece with a little um, landscape rid of that so you can see the whole thing this is what it is up front and it's a teaching piece because I don't have the sky hook because a picture's worth a thousand words and if you can get in there and you can see how I've hooked the sky that makes more sense than seeing it completely done right so here it is on the back and here's the places that I still need to hook clearly but down here this area is hooked in its entirety there is white right there, so that's not a hole. That is white. Um, but yeah, there's there's spaces, and there should be spaces. Um, there's a sp big space here, but if you notice, there's also a thread right there. That's because it's done with a special technique where a strip is actually sewn to the front of the rug um, to create a color and some depth. Almost like uh, Walderboro sculpting without having to cut anything because it dips down a little bit right there. Uh, Alyssa, you are welcome. Debbie is saying the black, white wool and the butterfly wings. What wool is it? It is the last tiny remnants I have from a uh, recycled skirt. So it's not wool that I have in stock anymore. It's a great wool for that. I've hooked, I think every monarch butterfly I've hooked, I've used it in. The background on your butterfly pencil pouch, is it a plaid? It has 
hints of turquoise. No, it is a spot dye. So this is a slightly darker version of it. So same recipe, just a slightly darker version of it. Let me hold them up side by side so you can kind of see them. It's hard once it's hooked to really see it, but this is a little bit lighter than what this is by about one shade. Elizabeth says, I love the hook in new format. It is a great place to learn. Thank you for that. Well, Elizabeth, thank you. I'm going to be calling that. I'm renaming that. It's going to be the same kind of thing, but I'm going to call it office hours. And you'll be happy to know that it'll be available for members of the Rug Cooking Journey. So that is going to be an exclusive feature for members. And it's office hours. And it is a Zoom call where you have a camera and a microphone and you turn your microphone on and we sit there and we talk and the rest of the people in the room listen, okay? And you hold up your hand and I call on you and we go through the process and I answer whatever it is you need to know. So that is going to be office hours and just stay tuned for, that's just a little tease, but stay tuned for that. That's coming up um, in the next few weeks. I'm slowly letting it percolate in deciding on dates and I need to coordinate with Kim and then I'll make some announces, announces. Elizabeth says, can we let you know prior to the hook in if we have a particular question so you can be better ready to handle? Absolutely. I'm always looking for questions for either these broadcasts or for the um, hook in. Um, do you outline inside or outside or on the line? Okay. When you hook on the line, you're 50% wrong, okay? Because what you're hooking, that loop goes half this way, half this way, right? So everything's going to grow and it's going to distort your design. You always want to hook inside the line. So there are two kinds of outlines. There's an outline that is inside the line for the motif. And then there's a the first row of background is often called an outline. So that gets a little confusing from that time. But most of the time when rug cookers say outline, we mean the first row hooked inside the motif. Holy cow, Barbara says the man that made press and seals, Jennifer McGuire's husband. You might be able to contact her and ask. Oh, interesting. Um, Barbara saying, do you bring up tails in a certain way to try to hide them? I always do it the simple way. No, I use textures. <laughs> if you use textures, you can't find tails. You only see tails when you are hooking in a solid. And even worse, if you're hooking in a solid that has been dyed incorrectly and has white core, then you really see the tails and they're really ugly. Um, and that's when you're going to want to try to hide them. But anything that you can do for the most part to end it so that your tail is hidden is not going to be a good solution because it's going to be very time consuming and tedious. And if you do it the same way on a row, they still all end up in the same place. Maybe they're one loop in. And what good is that? So I, I just do different strategies and I've done videos on hooking, find the one on hooking brick. That'll tell you a little bit more information on that. I made it to the end of the comments. Yay. So let me see, look at the comments, which mostly YouTube. So there, we still have a few people here on Facebook, but most of you are on YouTube. I have to look at the stats after the broadcast. Thank you for being here. And thank you for bearing with me. Um, this has been a very difficult time in my life and everybody has to go through it at some point and um thank you for the words of encouragement the cards that you guys have sent it, it's been amazing um and if i haven't personally answered your email just know that i am overwhelmed and sometimes the best i can do is send you a thank you graphic 
but it is very heartfelt and it's the best I can do right now. So thank you everybody. And, um, I will see you tomorrow on the hook in it's at four o'clock. Um, if you are a member of the rug cooking journey or any of my courses or simply signed up for the live email reminders, you have a user ID and a password. Use it, log in, click on that zoom link. That's all you need to do, right? If you don't have zoom, your system will ask you to download it and you just follow through. If you get stuck, just try it early in the day and give me a call. I'll be happy to walk you through. Hard time is the first time. After that, all you do is click a button and then you're there. So that's it, everybody. Thank you so much. Um, and I'll see you all next time. Bye for now.